Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister, Honorable Charles Oredu, the Commandant of the Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center, Airlines Marshal Vivian Evans, Director of the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research, Dr. Emmanuel Pesi Enim, Dr. Festus Ovin, Research Fellow, also at the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research, Mr. Mutaru Yumuni Mutar, Deputy Director for West African Center for Counter Extremism, Chief Superintendent Raymond Adolfin, Commanding Officer, Countering Terrorism Department, Ghana Police, esteemed participants, the media, ladies and gentlemen, you must welcome this morning to the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center and also to the Reflections on Security series. This lecture provides an open space within which topical as well as sensitive um, regional, national and international issues are discussed among relevant stakeholders. So before I invite the Commandant to give us the welcome remarks, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of other dignitaries amongst us. We also have with us Ambassador Baba Kamara, that is a former National Security Advisor and also an alumni of KIPDC. So can you please give us a wave, a wave please. Okay, thank you. We also have with us Mr. Farouk Bumaza, Deputy Head of Mission from the Algeria Embassy. Okay, you're most welcome, sir. And then we also have a representative from the Togo Embassy, John Peruyem. Okay, so please, you're most welcome. So on this note, I'll kindly invite the commandant of this institution to give us the welcome remarks. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you very much, Aisha. <clears throat> Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs, Honorable Ruridu, invited diplomats, senior officers of the Ghana Armed Forces, the Ghana Police Service, the Ghana Immigration Service, and the Ghana Customs Service, and uh, preventive, Ghana Customs Exercise and Preventive Service, the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, members of religious organizations, executives from the business community, and then the staff of the Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center, the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and I welcome you all to the Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center on behalf of our governing board and the executive committee. It's a delight for you to be here today to be part of our reflections on security series. The Reflections on Security Series serves as a platform for the exchange of ideas on topical and sensitive national, regional, and international issues with the view to inform policy decisions. I wish to especially welcome our speakers to you and distinguished participants to the seminar. Today's seminar focuses on the implications on the recent violent attacks perpetrated by extremist groups operating in Burkina Faso and neighboring areas, the Ansarul Islam, Asina Liberation, and the coalition of radical Islamic groups known as the Group for the Support of Islam and Muslims, abbreviated to be JNIM, J -N -I -N. They have taken advantage of the deteriorating security situations in parts of West Africa to perpetuate their agenda. The consolidation of resources and the different areas of operations of the individual groups involved in the coalition have served the strategic interests of JD. These include the consolidation of ethnic loyalties, commanding a regional network, and the expansion of its activities to neighboring states such as Benin and Togo who previously were invulnerable from the security threats from these criminal groups. The key question 
that the seminar seeks to address, therefore, is one, the nature and extent of the activities of these violent extremist groups operating in West Africa, and two, the implications of these activities on internal security <coughs> in our country, Ghana. This is because the expansion of violent attacks and kidnappings to neighboring countries, such as Benin and Togo, has generated fear and panic across different sections of society in our country. The key question on the minds of the citizenry relates to the level of preparedness and state security services and the robustness of response mechanisms that have been established by the states and ECOWAS to deal with the activities of violent extremist groups. The other question relates to the role of cross sections of society in preventing potential threats from violent extremist groups. Distinguished invited guests, today's seminar, which has been packaged as an experience sharing meeting, will focus on these issues. It is my fervent belief that the discussion session will produce ideas that will contribute to strengthening our country's capacity to confront potential threats from violent extremist groups operating in West Africa. We will only be successful if we deliberately come out with ideas, if we speak our minds, and if we join actively within the discussions that we will raise up. Ladies and gentlemen, Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center welcomes you to the center, and I wish you all fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commandant. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at this stage, I have the pleasure to invite the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister to also deliver his remarks. Shall we give my own applause, please? AVM Evans Griffith, members of the diplomatic corps, staff and officers of KAIPTC, ladies and gentlemen. Ghana is touted as the most stable, the most peaceful country in the sub region. This doesn't come as a flu, we all know that we've done a lot to achieve what we've achieved as a country. But I always say that this good things that people are saying about our country cannot be achieved if we are still confronted with instability within the neighboring countries. Ghana is surrounded by Cote d'Ivoire, by Burkina Faso, by Togo. So we cannot be in this region and so pride ourselves as very peaceful without putting in the necessary mechanisms to contain what is happening in the sub region now. Now, if you look at the Sahel region, for example, we have uh, these countries such as Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Niger, Mauritania, that are called the Group of Five. There are so many issues of instability within affecting these countries. Matters such as extreme poverty, matters such as high employment, we can also talk about illiteracy. We can talk about the demographic or the demographic boom, you know, more population, people giving birth. You can also talk about the incapacitation of these of central governments within these, these countries. These are what we we'll call the internal factors. What about the external factors? Now what is talking about climate change. 
This is contributing to the instability in these regions. Again, we all know what uh, uh, happened in Libya with the, with the overthrow of the, the, the former president. Now there are arms in the system. People are, you know, running arms, you know, bringing arms within the sub-region. And these are some of the things that are confronting us as a country and as a people within the sub-region. Within the, the 350 million market size, that was the economy that we face or that we have. If mechanisms are not put in place, investors will shy away from coming into our country. Our desire is to grow, you know, as, as, as countries, you know, economically we want to develop. But we cannot develop on our own. And investors will also not come in to help us develop if the countries are, are not stable. This platform is a you know, thought-provoking platform, an idea-sharing platform, sharing of best practices. And our expectation is that we are going to share ideas as to how to make the sub-region very stable, how to confront the myriad of, of challenges that we face, how to attract more investors into our countries, how to develop, how to, to, to grow our economy, how to develop to the level that we want to develop. So I'm, I'm eager, you know, to hear uh, 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 discussions, you know, lay out some of the programs, lay out some of the challenges, lay out some of the solutions, so that together we we'll help, you know, project this sub-region. First, starting from Ghana, project Ghana, then later the sub-region, and the continent as a very viable continent, a very viable place to do business where people are free to do, you know, go about their duties, where there's stability, where there's rule of law, where every institution works. So, uh, uh, Dr. Kofianan, I don't want to take the win out of your sale. Um, I'm eager, like, you know, most of the participants here, to listen to you, share ideas, and let's see how together we can tackle this act of instability that's confronting our country and our sub region. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like everyone here to engage with the KIPTC on Facebook and Twitter, both at KIPTCJ. And to also keep this conversation going, um, join us on the hashtag, hashtag, hashtag KIPTC RSS. Please, I repeat, hashtag KIPTC RSS. So on this note, I humbly call on Lydia Mezrato to introduce the chairperson for this August occasion. A round of applause for her, please. Thank you, Aisha. Good morning, distinguished invited guests. I have a great pleasure this morning to introduce to us our chair for this morning's seminar. Our chair presently serves as the director of Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research. He was the African Union's first counter-terrorism expert in 2005. And subsequently, he worked as a senior consultant to the UN's Department of Political Affairs in New York. Between 2015 to 2018, he served as the UN's, UN's Secretary General's representative on his advisory group for the Cape Building Fund. He was co-evaluator on the UN's global program on strengthening the legal regime against terrorism in May 2015. Asher has served as a consultant in a number of international organizations, and key among them are the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime, where he was a lead author on security links between trafficking and terrorism in the Sahel which was submitted to the UN Security Council. He was also consultant, senior consultant to the International Intergovernmental Action Group against money laundering and crime in West Africa, Java Airport. He produced a report on money laundering and corruption nexus in Ghana. He was also senior consultant, International Intergovernmental Action Group against money laundering 
and tourist financing in West Africa, Java Echoes. Here again, he produced a strategy paper on anti-drug trafficking in alcohol in West Africa. And the UN Secretariat in New York, our chair was a senior consultant to the Under Secretary General of the UN Department of Political Affairs and on drafting a report of the Secretary General on the relationship between the United Nations and regional organizations, in particular, the African Union in the maintenance of international peace and security. Finally, our chair was the evaluator, assessing the terrorism prevention branch of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, counter-terrorism training policies in Burkina Faso, Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and Djibouti. And he was also a lead writer of both the Africa and Global Reports on Terrorism between September 2006 and April 2007. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with a resounding round of applause, can you help me welcome our chair for today's seminar, Dr. Pesieni. Okay. Well, it was a very warm good morning to all of you, the commandants, the deputy minister for the affairs of the group who reviewed the dean of protocols of them. We couldn't have had a much better time to have this conversation. As to whether West Africa is becoming a new act of instability in the region, as to whether we are going a path to peace, or we are becoming a powder cake. The commandant has laid out the rules of the game that we seek to become an open space for honest discussions in which we challenge ourselves and look at our faces and discuss both the problems that are present, those that may emerge, and if we are not bold and honest, those that won't be emerge. There's absolutely no doubt in our minds that tells them and the threat of terror is becoming a challenge to our daily lives. From the Chad Basin to the Sahel Belt, the Central African Republic, states are facing tremendous challenges. Several years ago, we thought Burkina Faso, Somali, and the Sahel served as the central platforms for an emerging terrorist framework. But there are dramatic changes. Dramatic changes in which state survivability has actually become a conversation on a day to day basis. There's no doubt in my mind also that we've got three excellent speakers Dr. Pesto Sobin from the Center, a research fellow. Mr. Mutar Mumuni Mukta, Executive Director of the West African Center for counter extremism, daring, bold, and confronting on a day to day basis the challenges that we face and putting this life at risk. Superdeck and uh, to feel we're done, the commanding officer counter terrorism department. The ability to bring these two speakers, these three speakers here, once more demonstrates our drive to creating an open space for conversation. The meat or the details will be in their presentation. But even more importantly, will be the conversation that we will have after that. So they will all have between 15 to 20 minutes, and I'll be very, a very strict timekeeper, to share with us their initial thoughts. And I've told them to do a Hobbesian presentation, short, straight to the point, and absolutely no flapping around. Because Almost all of you here have strong viewpoints on what I'm sure we have to talk about. And I think we'll get to the brass tacks when we have the conversation. So we'll set the ball rolling. Dr. Pestos.
the, the chairman, um, the deputy minister of foreign affairs, the commandant, distinguished invited guests, senior officers, all protocol observed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, will, I would like to start my presentation by first of all um, thanking the commandants and the organizers of this event um, because it's quite timely and also very relevant looking at the current security landscape that we have within the West African um, sub region. My presentation will focus on the regional responses to terrorism in West Africa. And I'll be looking at some of the political issues that are impeding efforts to deal with issues of terrorism, look at some of the challenges, and then talk about some of the prospects of containing the spread of terrorism within the um, subreddit. Because my colleagues will be talking about some of the vulnerabilities and the issues that are leading to terrorism within the, um, the region. Now, if you take the continental scan of the scrutiny landscape in Africa, you will see that the incidence of life state conflict has virtually reduced. But in this place, we have emerging issues, and terrorism is one of the critical issues that confront countries within um, Africa, especially those in the Sahel um, region. And the statistics of the African Center for the Study and Research of, on Terrorism has, since the beginning of this year, rated the Sahel region as the, the most pronounced region encountering um, terrorism within um, Africa. So I'll focus mainly on the um, responses. Now, just a brief background before I come to my main issues. If you look at terrorism in, Af in West Africa and how it has evolved over the years, you will see that since 2012, 2011, when the Mali crisis erupted, the issue was only within Mali. But over time, the issue has spread to other countries within the Sahel region. We also had the Dechad Basin, but the issue was mostly within Nigeria. But now we have, we have Cameroon, Chad, all encountering um, issues of uh, terrorism. So currently, you look at the sub region and you see that Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso have become the epicenter of terrorism within the, um, the sub region. But also more important is the alliances and the growth of new terrorist groups that we have seen over the past um, seven years. Uh, years in the political situation in, in Mali. Initially, we had only uh, Boko Haram, and then we also had the Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. But today, we have proliferation of these groups spread across the Sahel and also the Lichard Basin um, region. So, for example, in Nigeria, apart from Boko Haram, we now have the Islamic State West African. Province that is also threatening stability within the, um, the Chad Basin area. Then we have the JNI, which is made up of four terror groups the Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Abu Rabiton, the Messina Liberation Front, and the Ansardi. And these are different terrorists with that formed alliance in 2017, also operating within the region. And then we have the Islamic State for the Greater Sahara, which is also a new group that has been formed operating within that um, stretch. And in Burkina Faso, the first terror group, group for the country was Ansaru Islam, which was um, created by Ibrahim Biko, who fought in the um, Malian crisis in 20, 2012. He formed that group within the region. So, you look at the operations over the years, and you see that there have been some geographical expansion, both locally and regionally. Now, if you look at currently, you look at this one, you will see that the JNI, which is made up of four terror groups, is controlling most of Mali, most of the um, northern part of Mali, 
and you have the Messina Liberation Front in the central part of Mali, which has become the epicenter of terrorism in recent um, times. And then you have Ansaru, which is between the border between um, Burkina Faso and then um, Mali, and the ISGS, which is also operating along the borders with um, Niger. And you see the geographical expansion over the years. Initially, they were just at Kidab and some northern states, but now they've captured most of these areas, especially within um, Mali and expanded. You look at Burkina Faso, when the uh, terrorism started occurring in the country, it was mostly along the borders with Mali. But now the border with Mali, Niger, um, and those with Benin and Togo have all recorded attacks since uh, 2017. So it's spreading. And you see that it's up to, this is the border with Ghana, and it's gradually descending um, down to, to Ghana. But the more important issue is the possible expansion to the coastal areas within the region. There are unconfirmed reports that these terror groups, especially Ansaru Islam and the JNIM, want to take Burkina Faso by the end of the year or early next year, they want to take about 70% of Burkina Faso. And once they control Burkina Faso, it gives them access to the coastal areas. And so that is why you see increasing attacks down south to the coastal areas in the, in the subway. And I'll tell you why they are coming forth. Now you look at how they operate within these areas. Mostly they dwell on local grievances to perpetuate their attacks. They dwell on the uh, socioeconomic challenges within the communities to grow their strength and to also get local support for their activities. So in most of the northern part of um, Burkina Faso where they operate, that is what they've been doing and also implementing social justice pro programs that initially has been provided by the state. They are serving as alternative to the state in the areas where they occupy within these regions. So now back to my main issues. What has been the regional responses? We have the response from FOS, and then we have two key ad hoc responses that are ongoing within the sub-region. At the ECOWAS level, ECOWAS counter-terrorism strategy that is uh, based on three prong approaches, prevent, pursue, and reconstruct. I'll come to that uh, shortly. And then we have the non-ECOWAS ad hoc responses, which is the J5 Sahel Initiative uh, Joint Force, and then the multinational joint task force in the Lake Chad base, uh, basin against um, Boko Haram. And this is for the Sahel region. But beyond that, we also have France Operation Bakan, the EU, US, and AU in the Sahel also operating within um, the region to respond to the threat of terrorism, aside the national response mechanisms. And so um, I'll be focusing on ECOWAS and these two uh, ad hoc mechanisms. At the ECOWAS level, like I said, we have the prevent, pursue, and reconstruct framework that ECOWAS developed to deal with terrorism within the sub-region. And mostly the prevent um, framework is looking at the conditions that are conducive for terrorism in the region and trying to respond to these conditions, the socioeconomic challenges, the dem demographic issues, and the, all the issues that are leading to terrorism within the sub-region. And this, the pursue indicator is looking at how to counter terrorism when it occurs. So ensuring rapid response to terrorism when it occurs. And after the aftermath of terrorism, what has to be done to repair societal um, issues and also to protect the human rights issues. Now, you look at the level of implementation and you see that ECOWAS is making great strides in terms of implementing its counter-terrorism um, approach, but it's been very slow. So they've, 
The strategy called for the establishment of these institutions, the Counterterrorism Coordination Unit, which has been established, the ECOWAS Arrest Warrant, ECOWAS Blacklist of Terrorists and Criminal Groups, which is yet to be um, implemented, and then the ECOWAS Training Manual, this, which they've used to train a lot of um, people within the, the sub region. And then we have the Multinational Joint Task Force against Boko Haram, which is headquartered in Jamena in Cameroon, and also operating, involving um, these countries from the Le Chad Basin, Benin, Chad, Cameroon, Nigeria, and then Niger, deployed mainly to deal with Boko Haram within the Le Chad Basin area. And mostly, the activities of this force has actually degraded the capacity of Boko Haram, limited the attacks, and also arrest of militants and rescue of several hostages within the, the Chad Basin area. And then the G5 Sahel, which is made up of five countries, Mauritania, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, and basically dealing with counter-terrorism and transnational organized crime within the Sahel belt of West Africa, involving about 500 troops divided within three operational commands, the Western, Eastern, and Central Command, located in Niger, uh, Mali, and then Mauritania. And they are also fighting terrorism within that stretch of West Africa. Now, there are certain political issues that are impeding effort to deal with terrorism within the sub-region, and that is the focus of this um, site. One is the suspicions among um, key members of the multinational Green task force against um, Boko Haram. Now, though these countries are operating, Nigeria, Chad, um, uh, Cameroon, are operating within the Chad Basin, what is happening is that these members are suspicious of each other's um, um, uh, responses. For example, Nigeria and Cameroon, because of the Bakasi issue, still have issues of mistrust, despite the fact that they are cooperating with each other. But the mistrust is even more pronounced between Nigeria and Chad for several reasons. And one of the reasons is that the Chad, um, um, Chad claims part of the Chad basin belongs to Chad. So there are border issues between Nigeria and then Chad. And also, in 1983, about 700,000 Chadians were deported from Nigeria to Chad. And that created a lot of friction between the um, two countries. And also, during the time of Muammar Gaddafi, he was supporting Chad during the civil war within that country. And because of Gaddafi's relations with Nigeria, there were suspicions between Nigeria and Chad as to what, I mean, all the support from um, Gaddafi was doing within the northeastern part of, of, of Nigeria. So those suspicions are impeding efforts to deal with terrorism within the Chad basin. So what is happening is that most of them operate within their national contest, but they don't cross to each other's uh, contest. The second issue is the Algeria's regional ambitions and exclusion from the G5 Sahel. Now, if you look at the, all the terror groups within the Sahel, especially Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, it traces its history to the Algerian civil war in the 1990s. And Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, for example, originated from the GSPC, which originated from um, the civil war in um, Algeria. And Algeria, all these issues also started in the southern part of Algeria before it came to um, uh, Mali. And Algeria has been the original hegemon within that Sahel belt. But if you look at the J5 Sahel Initiative, which was initiated by France and other EU uh, partners, Algeria was excluded. And because of that, it's become very difficult to deal with the aspect of terrorism within the Algerian um, uh, border areas. Without Algeria within the J5 Sahel Initiative, 
that is not going to work because Algeria boasts of Africa's biggest army and also when it comes to counter-terrorism, Algeria is one of the best countries we can ever use in fighting terrorism. ECOWAS and the creation of the J5 Sahel Force. ECOWAS had reservations because ECOWAS wanted to be the political, be the leadership of dealing with terrorism in West Africa. But the J5 Sahel Force is mainly spearheaded by France and other partners, and ECOWAS is more or less like a backbencher when it comes to dealing with issues within the Sahel uh, um, belt. And France is more or less taking um, control over some of these um, interventions. Now, the UN Security Council politics. J5 Sahel wanted a peacekeeping mandate. When it has a peacekeeping mandate, what it does is that it gives it predictable um, financing. But well, one of the challenges facing it is financing. If you look at all the member countries, they are suffering locally. And so J5 Sahel wanted U.S. speaking mandates, just like the intervention brigade in DRC. But that was denied by the United States in the Security Council because it felt that when it does that, what is going to happen is that it's going to shift funding from France, EU, to the, um, to the U.S. within uh, because it provides majority of the funding for peacekeeping within that area. And so because of that, it is actually affecting the J5 Sahel Force in terms of its um, uh, activities within the Sahel region. And political will among the J5 countries. If you look at all the countries, you will see that Chad and Mauritania are not so much hit by terrorism, but it's Niger, Mali and then um, Burkina Faso. And so when it comes to providing the funding and support, these countries are not eager to pay for what they term as Mali's own security problem. Because the problem that we are seeing is emanating from the weakness within the state structure of Mali. And then the role of invisible hands and conflict entrepreneurs. We have to be very blunt on these things. When it comes to the weapons, when it comes to the vehicles, when it comes to all the funding and logistics, where are they coming from? Who is providing these uh, resources for these terror groups? How can a terror group be more sophisticated than five different countries that have monopoly over the use of force? You know, so there, the role of invisible hands are also frustrating um, these uh, interventions. The pitfalls. One of the challenges confronting the aggressive terrorism within the region is the transracial nature of the threat. Now, if you look at uh, Boko Haram, it's operating not only in West Africa, but also Eastern Africa. If you look at the Sahel, the Sahel does not include only West African countries, but also countries in North Africa. And so that is making intervention very difficult within the region. Overcrowded security responses. If you look at the security landscape, we have a lot of actors that are pursuing similar agenda, leading to overcrowding and also leading to duplication of efforts. You can talk about Germany, the new smart friends, US troops, EU, Israel, all operating within this crowded security landscape. And that is actually frustrating effort. A lack of operational capacity. Funding, funding is mostly restricted to donor funding for all these activities that we are talking about. If you look at the funding, it's mostly coming from EU, France, and other, by, um, other donor countries. Countries within the sub-region are not providing the needed financing to finance these um, uh, ad hoc measures. And that is also frustrating efforts in terms of dealing with um, within the Sahel region. Multiple deployment by all the countries. You see that if you look at the J5 Sahel multinational Joint Task Force, they are providing troops to MINUSMA, they are providing troops, Niger is providing troops for uh, J5 MINUSMA, they are providing troops, um, Burkina Faso, the same. That has led to overstretch and also stretching 
the, the, the force, diversity of armed groups. Unlike the late Chad Basin, which is dealing with only Boko Haram, in the Sahel, there are multiple groups, making it difficult to target one group to um, deal with, and lack of trust and support from the local communities. I'll quickly rush through some of the things I think we can um, look at in terms of dealing with this. One is ensuring realistic, predictable source of funding for terrorism within the West African region. Without funding, we cannot deal with this increasing threat of terrorism. Then you taking leadership of these counter-terrorism measures because, um, because of the politics among states within the ad hoc I mean, measures. Most of our interventions have also been military oriented, leaving the preventive aspects of dealing with terrorism. And that has also caught local support for some of the jihadist groups within those um, regions. So we need to look at the preventive aspect of terrorism, dealing with the socioeconomic issues, and also um, resourcing the defense and security forces to be more responsive, functional, and accountable. Because in Mali, Burkina Faso, the essence of the security agencies is rather fueling more violence in those areas, the human rights abuses and all that. And lastly, we need to deal with the governance issues and making the state present in every part of the territorial um, borders of each country. Most of the places where these groups are operating from are places that lack state presence. You look at northern Burkina Faso, because of the political crisis in Ouagadougou, very weak um, state structure in there. You look at Mali, the same thing. So we need to deal with extending the state presence and also dealing with the government issues. I'll stop here during the discussion. We'll have more time to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sosovic. I will now invite Mr. Mutaru Shita to speak to us. Please, 20 minutes. Good morning, the chairperson, the honorable deputy minister, the commandant, diplomats, distinguished invited guests, the media, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to discuss these very important security uh, matters and within our region. I'll be looking at the community approach to it, the preventative angle to dealing with this challenge. You realize that a lot of times it's often disproportionately focused on state counterterrorism measures. And so we are looking at the preventative angle to this. So look at the presentation in this form. Um, the threats in West Africa and the character of the hard threat, what I classify as the hard threat, and the attempted measures against the threat, and a phenomenon um, we term as from rejection to attraction. We we'll look at the soft threats to uh, this, the youth, whether it's a demographic, demographic dividend or a demographic time bomb. Youth radicalization in West Africa and building com um, community resilience against the threat. The last 10 years. West Africa has become a sustained center, a hotbed for terrorist violence. And at the beginning, we we'll look at, say, 2009, building up to a peak around 2014, where West Africa reported um, the deadliest region globally 
or terrorist violence, even far ahead of ISIS. Over 7,500 fatalities within this single space. And since then, even though the numbers are down today, we're seeing a pervasive presence in terms of movement of the threat descending down. This is about a year ago, a year and a half ago. But the, the threat descending down to the coastal towns of, I mean, countries of West Africa. This is a threat that is unfamiliar. Our security orientation is unaccustomed to. So it was a very new challenge in terms of dealing with it. A challenge that led to the loss of many secret officials who were looking to combat this. Very simple, improvised explosive devices were very, very difficult to handle by security agencies, especially in Nigeria. And we saw many police numbers and security numbers falling for you know, inappropriate um, dealing or handling improvised explosive devices. This, and because this was a very new security challenge, it was very difficult for security agencies to handle. And so instead of intelligence-led measures or targeted measures, there were lots of large-scale human rights violations and atrocities, which elicited strong backlash, very, very dangerous backlash from the local community. And of course, significantly undermining counterterrorism efforts. In terms of the character of the threat, um, an increased radicalization, we saw increased radicalization following the collapse of the caliphate and its determination to replenish its legion of fighters within new areas, especially areas that hitherto didn't have terrorism. And we found that in the last four years, it was a remote possibility in the psyche of people in Burkina Faso or in Cote d'Ivoire to imagine that this could befall them. And we're seeing this a very consistent pattern, a pattern that is preempted, that is influenced also by ISIS, Al Qaeda, because they're looking to assume you know, presence in new areas to project themselves to gain that international prominence the whole has enjoyed in the last five years. And so amongst these areas, these terrorist groups, there's a sort of competition for territorial dominance amongst them. And they're looking for some sort of validation, endorsement from ISIS. We saw two months ago, there's a video image from the leader of ISIS, you know, al-Baghdadi. So he did a video after a very long time, he hadn't appeared in the public space. And in this video, he's acknowledging Burkina Faso and what happened in Burkina Faso. And he endorsed the group that allowed that launch the attack in Burkina Faso. And this is something the group, the group is hungry for. They are looking for things like that. Because, you know, you know, ISIS is a sort of, you know, attractive, very sexy, you know, terrorist organization that most groups would like to associate with. And so they're looking for that validation from them. And among them, you see a sort of the that competition is not necessarily healthy. Because you see IS, ISGS, Islamic State in the Great Sahara, with Al Murabi II. This is where once the same group, the leader of that group used to be, I mean, it's a guy, apparently has a name called uh, Muqtar, but Muqtar by Muqtar. And this group, they've been fighting amongst each other for territorial dominance in this, in this uh, new space. And we're seeing a disproportionate focus on combat approach in dealing with this menace. The lacking in terms of intelligence measures, targeted measures, and because of that, we're seeing significant, you know, uh, resistance on the part of local community to support counterterrorism measures. We're seeing measures in terms of, you know the economic and social, social aspect of the measures in terms of state involvement, economic measures that far are inadequate in terms of its capacity to dissuade frustrated people. 
And so there's this phenomenon of from rejection to attraction. In the beginning of Boko Haram in particular, it received strong rejection from the local community. Young people, they became very vulnerable people. But because counterterrorism measures were not properly targeted, they were not intelligence led, so they acted on rumors, rumors in the community that in this particular community they are Boko Haram members. So instead of conducting intelligence led or targeted measures, everyone becomes a victim. And surviving members of this community, either family members or just members of the community, instead of siding with state, they rise up in arms against the state. So it moved from rejecting Boko Haram, rejecting this violence, this threat, to supporting it. And there is an attraction for it, because there already exists that sense of vulnerability amongst you know, people in the local community. And you see a phenomenon that is often cited, counterterrorism measures can in themselves produce terrorism. And we see it played out in many zones globally. And this is what characterized largely many of the efforts of the Nigeria counterterrorism efforts. The single biggest constituent in this issue, with this threat, is, is the youth. And if you look at the demographic, the demographic profile of West Africa, it's not encouraging to describe the youth as a demographic threat time bomb. But essentially, that is what, I mean, this is what the, this picture paints. We have a very youthful population, a median age of 18 years. And some are really, really, um, for instance, you are having a share happening 56% of this population under 18 years. And this group is the most vulnerable group in terms of the tendency to get radicalized and to engage in terrorism. We have a very, very high unemployment rate, ranging from the single digits within the sub region to as high as 23 percent. We have a youth, a youth culture highly mobile, highly ambitious, and very exaggerated expectations. So you're looking at a very, very vulnerable, I mean, demographic high unemployment rate, you would see this is a phenomenon that characterizes nearly the entire West African sub-region. As an agency announces for graduate recruitment in Nigeria, for instance, this was in Lagos. This, was a, this is a, grad, I mean, a recruitment center. This is not a football match. It's a recruitment center. They advertise for recruitment. 4,500 you know, vacancies, and you have over 56,000 applicants. It's not very different. A year ago in this country, in Ghana, we had the Ghana Immigration Service advertising for um, 500 people. They are looking for 500 people. You had 84,000 people putting in an application. I'm sure anyone who passed, through, passed by LWAC saw the queue. I've never seen anything like that. And this characterizes the entire, the entire West African sub-region. And this is what I call, you know, a demographic, you know, time bomb waiting to explode. It just needs a trigger. So these conditions make young people very, very precarious, very economically precarious, and very easy for terrorist recruitment and instrument into terrorist groups. Boko Haram in the past, like any other groups, have lured very vulnerable and ignorant people into their food. For instance, this was very popular in the Central African Republic. It became a very key um, feature in terms of Boko Haram's recruitment uh, methods. So for instance, they come to the local community, they're going to recruit people for an international humanitarian organization. And so people could apply and you get paid a monthly salary of $180. And you're given parcels to deliver, deliver to specific locations in Nigeria. These parcels are actually formed. You go and it explodes. 
So many of the victims, in terms of suicide, they didn't know what they were leaving, I mean, they were meant to do. Before Central African Republic got to discover that this, a lot of people were, after, I mean, already recruited into it. Okay. 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 Online radicalization for the youth, the cyberspace is a sustained environment, it's a sustained platform for terrorist recruitment and radicalization. And because young people have an exaggerated expectation of society, exaggerated aspirations, enabled by technology, social media in particular, I'm hoping this resonates with people. Because social media is a platform that has, over time, exaggerated young people's expectation, expectations of their society and of their leaders. And so far more than their own capabilities can fetch them, and far more than the governments within this region could afford them. And this can lead to frustration. This frustration can lead to anger. This anger can lead to things like that, terrorist recruitment and terrorism itself. When people do presentations about counter-terrorism, a lot of people ask you all the time, why do people engage in terrorism? It sounds simplistic to just say someone, every one of us is vulnerable to radicalization. It's very difficult for the average person to understand what would make somebody take his own life, especially, you know, he take another person's life and take his own life in the process. The single biggest reason, the single biggest factor that leads people to engage in terrorism is radicalization. And radicalization is a process that a person goes through, influenced by multiple factors, like all this. Unemployment, negative religious ideologies or political propaganda, a dysfunctional social or economic backgrounds, people who have experienced over a period of time a cultural experience of injustice. This together can collectively lead a person to a destination where he considers violence as a legitimate tool to express himself. And at that point, the person exhibits certain tendencies. For instance, he sees the world in a binary mode between black and white, between us and them. He creates an adversarial outlook for himself. And at that point, mentally, the, that dis destination he is a person who is radicalized, who views violence as a legitimate tool to express himself. But when someone is radicalized, it doesn't mean that they go about killing people. It just means that they are prone to using violence or choosing violence to register their grievances. Certain factors are needed to escalate their commitment to engage in terrorism. And so they need just a, a trigger. And we have a significant number of young people in this mode within the West African sub region. So they self-legitimize violence. They don't see violence in the way we see violence. They see it as a legitimate way to express themselves. The picture you have, the outlook you have, they don't have that. They don't have gray space you know, in, their, in their heads or in their minds for analysis. They don't have gray analysis capacity to do. And so they, they see the world in this form and they self-legitimate violence. So how do you deal with this? If you understand the, the threat, how do you deal with the threat? We say that security measures are a function of threat perception. The models or the measures you take to deal with a particular security threat is a function of your own perception of the threat. It would inevitably lead you to take a certain measure based on your perception of the threat. So for instance, in this country, we believe that international terrorists are the biggest single threat to this nation, who would inevitably have to focus on the borders and traditional sources of this threat. But if you believe that homegrown terrorism is the biggest threat to this nation, then we begin to look at the local community and the vulnerability factors that can lead us to you know, counter that effectively. So we come from a preventative background in dealing with this threat because we believe that the battle against terrorism or fight against terrorism 
you know, and the negative ideologies that underpin it cannot be won on the battlefield. It will be won in the mindset from the local community, from vulnerable groups, and that's how you can sustainably deal with terrorism. And so, in the last four years in this space, we have worked within the local community, dealing with local community agents and vulnerable groups to help them understand what it means to be radicalized to engage in terrorism. There are a significant number of people who are actually in the process of being radicalized without knowing that they are on that journey or on that path. And in the last four years, we have come up with significant information that will shock many people in this space. People who engage in cyberspace, on the, I mean, cyberspace with people outside of this country, terrorist groups outside of this country. We have helped dissuade at least 22 individuals who were on this path. A high profile case of a guy, 2016, who had been radicalized online by ISIS, an Algerian recruiter, meant for ISIS in Syria. And just a day before he was meant to leave, depart through Burkina Faso, Agadez, into North Africa, he watched our television program on counter radicalization. And that was what made the difference. And so our contention is we need to look at this from a preventative angle. Combat approaches are not adequate to sustainably you know, win the battle against terrorism. We've done this in the last 12 years. We've done this in this space using state and non-state actors disproportionately focused on combat missions. We need to deepen our government within the local community to understand the vulnerabilities that lead people to become radicalized to engage in terrorism. We understand that one of the biggest reasons why Boko Haram succeeded was because they understood the youth better than the government of Nigeria. We have to do a better job at understanding the vulnerabilities or the aspirations of young people. And that is the only sustainable way of defeating terrorism in this space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mutaro. And I have the distinct pleasure of inviting Chief Superintendent Adivia to share his thoughts with us. Chief Superintendent. I have not heard a prayer at the beginning so unconventional in uh, our side of the world. And I'm going to do it right now, the way we do it in my unit. We all know that when God doesn't want us to do anything, he tells us exactly. And so we always pray that God should prevent us from doing what we know we shouldn't do, which we go on doing. The Commandant Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, my own mentor, Dr. Kwesiemi, fellow discussants, Commissioner of Police, Mr. Yagi, invited guests here, the Honorable Minister. I'm happy and honored to be called here this morning. I'll be talking on the topic, the global terrorist threat, Ghana's response challenges, and the way forward. I have put these slides here, because I'm in the classroom, but I'll go off this and speak what I do and what we see in the film. About five years ago, when I was called to the headquarters to start this unit just after the death of Kofi Annan, I mean, uh, um, Kofi Aounu, a lot of people were asking, when is Boko Haram coming to Ghana? Especially when I was saying bye to Commissioner Yagi in the Eastern region to go country headquarters, people were asked why I'm leaving the training school. When I was chasing doctor in 2014-2015, and he actually agreed and followed us to Bolga with Dr. 
um, like my auntie Danso and others, people were not welcoming them because they thought we were doing something that would not come to Ghana. I remember Sheikh here, we invited him to help us when our young men were running to Libya. And when you go to a zone communities, you go to a school, you go to a mosque, you go to even areas like Adama where you see that they need education, people do not receive. I'm not going to say I'm happy to now know, but I will say it is refreshing that today everybody is now asking to know what is happening. And it is for that reason that the topic today, reflection, is important. The trend of terrorist incidents in Burkina Faso, very close to Ghana, understandably provoking our current national posture, civil society outright, and some media narratives. Violence is saying that when your neighbor's beer is on fire, you put water by yours. Uh, my colleague was telling me that you rather put your beer into the water. And I think our national strategic reaction has traveled an extra mile, creating fire doubt, and this is demonstrated by not only the Accra initiative that resulted in the West African take that from national strategic level down to the operational and tactical security level to protect our porous borders as well as collaborate to fight all kinds of organized and cross-border crimes in addition to the earlier international collaborations with um, which goes to the G7, um, especially countries that consider the G7, especially the US and exercise Epic Guardian in 2016 and with the UK in Projakara in 2017 and we are still doing this recent data with our neighboring countries, especially Burkina Faso, Niger, Benin, Côte d'Ivoire, and Togo, called Operation Udambu, that's friend, friendless. Internally, the collaborative efforts of our security forces, fortunately, have been consistent since the death of our eminent Professor Kofi Auna in the Kenya Mall attack in September 2013, and has been progressive defying every divide, whether institutional or political. You may be hearing that the military and the police have challenges. You may be hearing that various institutions have challenges. You, we have had change in the political system, but this has not changed the internal efforts to deal with this kind Evidently, the recent reactions only further validate the realization that if the 9 11 attacks and those earlier by Akim and Al Shabab were in any case regarded as happenings that, that were far from Ghana and that we must mind our own business, the emergence of Boko Haram and other terrorist groups in Nigeria, Chad, Niger, Mali, including the death of the professor I mentioned. Well, if those were not enough as warning, the recent dramatically escalating debilitating attacks in Burkina Faso, just 448 kilometers in the north, and an earlier attack in La Côte d'Ivoire, uh, constitute enough warning that the continent that we inhabit as Africans is an environment that terrorists exist and can operate, selecting their targets based on their own work perception of evolving issues that grant them the opportunity to carry out their agenda, believing they will be successful and will win sympathy. Terrorists don't just go where they want. They go where they can. Ghana's efforts, however, inadequate, we may perceive it to be have been to make it more difficult, if not impossible, for terrorists to consider this country as a choice, either by its attractiveness or easement. Ghana must not be a choice, 
And this can only be sustained by concerted efforts by all of us. My aim here today is to share with you our response to this threat. I will do this by touching on the current reality, which my colleagues have already touched. Ghana's response to a threat, the challenges, and the way forward. And this is where I will just be running because they've already talked about those things. The current reality, the warning signs they've already given us. If you see the red spot here, I was just in Bunkubu in 2016. And if you see the kind of attacks that are happening around Burkina, that have happened in Mali and Niger, small arms and lethal weapons, or motors, just young men who have not gone for any military, professional military training, were those doing it. And what you see there is military and police officers giving shots in exchange with these people. And when you go to ask them, you realize that they will tell you you cannot do it in Burkina Faso. You could see that a few years ago, Ghana and Burkina Faso looked alike. The last attack was just here. I was in Chilpani, and Chilpani is just around here as a moment. Traditionally, those in that particular area and those in Burkina Faso and Togo share the same language, the same culture the same system of security. You realize that there is total absence of the state here, as I mentioned. There is a gap between even the traditional authorities and the, and the government formal authorities over there. You realize that there are issues of health, education, and security over there. And so these are the broken windows that if Abdul Hakim and co, who are now saying that they want to set countries in Ghana and elsewhere want to enter. These are the broken windows that they will want to use. I will want to sound so much uh, of an idea. And so this has already been given to you, and this is what we are seeing. The, the response, the green spots, indicating where initially, I have shown you the map indicating how Burkina Faso and Ghana looked alike without any attack previously around 2014, 2013, thereabout. And we would have even thought that Ghana would have been attacked first. Because at that time, if you talk of security, someone will even tell you you can't do it in Burkina Faso because they had a good of robust security. But we need to ask ourselves how come? You see the, the spot here. That's what we now have in Burkina. The red spots indicate the government has lost total control. If you see the pink spot, means that they are now sharing presence there and authority with them. The only place of now in control by government is what we are seeing here in the I was in Burkina just last month. And I can tell you that it is only a matter of time if we all don't extend our efforts beyond just taking the fireball to help them. The, the, the speech or the request made by the Burkina Bay minister in the UN recent conference indicate clearly that they are losing control even then. Because there are 16,000 UN operatives in, I think, Chad or so. We have over 600 G5 um, troops also operating in Mali. Yet, it is not sufficient. So it is not the military action that will help us. So if by January this year, this is how Burkina looked like, it moved here, and now this is how Burkina... And even the last time you could say this is the case was in April. I'm just running through for us to get the current reality. And these are the hotspots. The increasing change, the increasing change of the dynamics and shift of the threat of the terrorist activities through 
especially West Africa. When I talk about the changing dynamics, um, my colleague Montari was mentioning economic factors. He was mentioning radicalization. He was mentioning other factors like unemployment, porous borders. These are the conventional factors that we, we, we know. But we reflect over the lack of proximity between central government and the local community and the local populace. Do we look at the breaking down of trust between the security forces and the populace? We are having police officers and other security officers attacked in Ghana, and we see that the attacks over in Burkina Faso are on military facility. They would have come to do that job to tell us that our security agencies are weak, but we are already doing that for them. We would have made it difficult for them to come and collect intelligence on our shopping malls. But our media are already taking that and giving it to them quickly. They would have come to know that we, we are not prepared with certain logistics to fight them when they come. But we are already projecting that. In our media narrative, and at times, if we are seeking for help, in an age where we are saying that we are independent, and where we have an institution like this that we are all come to learn the tools of conflict resolution and security strategies when we are inviting help from outside. Why would we send them to gather intelligence without our presence on our bodies? We need to be more alert and we need to be more vigilant because Traditional, we have our chiefs, we have our communities, we have the linguists, and you cannot go to a community like mine and my or that is around Mana and come out without people noticing. Even in Accra, our tradition is said that you cannot even enter into Buko, you cannot go to even Sabuzongo, you cannot go to Padana, where we now have different people from all over, different even from different countries, and come out without them noticing. It clearly uh, shows that we are becoming so complacent. Um, transnational and organized camps, uh, weapons, weapons, drugs, human. Uh, I don't want to uh, go by local support logistics, uh, local support logistics support. Um, good versus evil, IEDs. So I'm only I'm trying to run over this because they are already mentioned here. What I'm trying to let you reflect on it is that all these issues, including presence of strongholds and safe heavens, let's look at the northeastern corridor where we have large mountainous forest areas around from a uh, um, Oti area down to Bimbula, Shiripone, um, down to Bunkrubu, Boku, going to Para, and then run back to uh, Dollar Power around Upper West. You realize that these whole areas are forest. I believe the academia, I know, not just we, because they have said it over and over again. And we ourselves have gone there. We see this And it's important that we move beyond just on maybe talking about these things to real action and ensuring that these issues that we have mentioned here, that you have seen here, that exist in our neighboring countries, that are creating the entry plans for terrorists. Are dealt with. I'm actually not going to be talking to them one by one because they have already talked about them. And they are issues that you see every day on social media. So I just want you to reflect over them once again. And when I get to government response, I will um, talk more on that. What you see here was what I would call shape on when these boys were going out. And I think that is the time that we all will have reacted as we are. 
As soon as things told down, we all went back to sleep. I remember I was called midnight when Kofi Awunu was still in Kenya. I was actually on duty. I was called to run to home. I came and sat down for over two years without action taken for us to right. And it was all agencies. It's not only a Ghana police service. It is all agencies that were supposed to work on this. I remember very well that we even moved everybody to Bolivia and sent the National Crisis Response um, Court. <laughs> that resulted in exercises. But after, after that, we all went back to sleep. Some bitter lessons. These are attacks that can happen here. I want to just reflect on this. I want us to reflect on this. Now, what lessons have been learned from that? Means of attack. I feel so strange to that we are saying that it will not happen here. Let's look at the local support. Let's look at grievances. Let's look at tactics. This is where I want to um, say something. We are talking about radicalization. And in a kind of language, they will say, Omo Dada Omo. But we are talking of a situation where hopeless are probably crying. If you look at researches that have been done in the cycle, they go beyond the conventional factors that we are talking about to look at what people are crying for personal security and the protection of their families. Not because the security agencies are not working, not because politicians are probably pulling the strings of the security agencies. Not because the media are overblowing what is actually in the field. Not because the academia are not publishing. And not because the populists are undermining their security services. But it is interaction of all these factors. And that is why I am calling upon everybody today to look beyond these factors that are listed here. To so looking internally, of course, where you have security institutions, where you have national institutions locating their loyalty in political parties, locating their loyalty in individuals and not the country, where we are putting our personal interests first instead of national security, then you can be sure that as the two said, national security is at rest. All of us, sleep ourselves, let's ask ourselves, the Nangas, you and I are patronizing them. We are talking of the vigilantes. You and I are patronizing them. Why do we have security agencies, state security agencies, that we are saying that they are corrupt, we are saying that they are unprofessional, we are saying that they are not well equipped, and we go in for the disasters, we go in for the landers. We are creating, we are creating a situation. Um, I'm told my time is running. It is true that these groups are present. It is good, it is true that they are present, but Abdul Hakim is very close. If we are not able to use the opportunity to close the gap between central government and the local authorities, we are not able to make our, it is not just a security pre uh, presence in the communities, but it is the dialogue. It is not about this conference alone, but it is about us moving beyond these conferences to have actual, that can we have public forums in the communities beyond their security presence with guns? Can we go beyond law enforcement to actually give protection to build that trust? And can our populace again see that even if our security forces are not professional, they are, they are better than 
um, using rules and uh, vigilantes and others. The agreed strategic intention is to coordinate effective multi agency common spatial awareness and action to prevent terrorist attacks and, in the event of any attack, to coordinate a timely intervention to neutralize any threat and minimize the attack. Ghana had a counter terrorism law. We have the national strategy. We have the we have the action plan, and we have a policy for the coordination of all the agencies. What you see here, what you see here is a national security agency which we work on a daily basis to even go down to the local communities, educate various communities and the populace together. But there are certain things that we have now. We used to have the, the, the border guards who were military men. Now we have the migration. You can see that the military is now relocating again there to support, and they are coming in to support the police. Too. And so in terms of the arrangements, policies, laws, they are adequate enough to uh, protect us. Just look at these issues that I have um, listed here. And you realize that these are issues that we are already aware. There are a lot of guns in town. Requirements of national, regional governments. Intelligent sharing of missions. It has been done. I mentioned cooperation with the Anglo and the others, but it is not enough. We do it and go and sleep. Capacity enhancement of our security. Training is very important and it is being done, but it must actually be used and not to train and go back and sleep. Common quick response deployment. We now have communication set up that. You can really sit at the police headquarters, you can sit in other areas and be able to locate teams at strategic points to respond. We have strengthened partnership in regional city efforts. Let's talk of our local situation. Either to equal to equal. But I'm happy everybody is now trying to come on board for us to work on these things um, together. The requirement of the civil society, this has been um, a reality. I want to make a simple appeal. Yes, logistics are not enough. It is a truism. The challenges of poverty, those conventional issues mentioned, are two. But I want us, in this deeper reflection, locate the problem, our inability, our challenges, and our attitude. We know what is needed, but we so soon go to sleep after the rain stops. The question I want to leave with all of us is when there is a breakout of malaria, do we go buying malaria drugs and put them by our side when it has not yet got to us? Do we fumigate and change our behavior, our sanitary behavior? Or we leave this and sit down and use the money to buy coffee or use it to cure when it has been and may have gone out to other disease. On this note, I call on all of us to just reawaken ourselves and do the exact things of supporting our police, our security services, of the politicians, yet the least for right to influence, but to ensure that the equipment that we need to put the American Air Force together are actually acquired within the possible shortest time for us to use. And for the academia, 
I want to reiterate the fact that the, the research findings are really workable in the field. They are the tools that have been used to resolve conflicts in areas that we either do thought that we have to go and bring experts somewhere. And so the, we need to have confidence in this research findings. I want to thank the Institute for inviting me here. And I will sit down and if they need to respond to some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you.